My name is Hannah Mansbach, and I'm here with Congressman Mike Quigley's office. Um, he is the co-chair of the Transparency Caucus, so you know we're really excited to have you guys here. We have some great panelists. Um, yeah, and I'll just kick it off to Daniel. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first event for the 116th Congress for the Congressional Transparency Caucus. I'm thrilled to be doing this again with Representative Quigley's office. Thank you again for hosting this and for, for doing like all the amazing work that you guys do around transparency and accountability. So we have an amazing uh, lineup for you guys today. You should have uh, a list of the panelists that's on your chair. I'm not going to go through and do a song and dance about the descriptions, but you can find all uh, videos from prior events for the Congressional Transparency Caucus or the Advisory Committee on Transparency that I help coordinate, along with Alex Howard, who is around here in the, um, what is that? Linen. Linen suit, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. The technology is, I'm a lawyer by training, so like making this stuff work is, is not my thing. Um, but we're going to go through this. The way it's going to work is we'll do quick presentations, five or six minutes from each of our folks, and then we'll do Q&A at the end, which is why I've got this Voice of God microphone. Uh, if you want more information about the Transparency Caucus, you can either go to uh, Representative Quigley's site, or if you want about information about the Advisory Committee, uh, you can go to transparencycaucus.info, where we have more information as well. So without any further ado, excitement, or other words of um, uh, introduction, uh, Mr. Horowitz, please. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thank you for having me today. This is a great event. I'm going to uh, down arrow. I'm going to be talking about oversight.gov. Um, this is a project that we launched uh, in October 2017. The IG community, the federal IG community, um, launched. There are 73 federal IGs. For those of you who don't know, um, and um, it, before Oversight.gov was launched, um, if you wanted to see what 73 IGs were doing, you went to 73 different websites uh, to see the reports. Oversight.gov and the idea, be the idea behind it was to bring 73 to one, to bring all of those websites together, uh, not the websites literally themselves, but the reports into one place so that um, folks could uh, find them in one location. We also on the same day launched our first ever Twitter account for SIGI, so um, if you want to follow the IG community, you can now do so by um, signing up for our Twitter feed. And what it does is, every time a report is posted to oversight.gov, there's a tweet sent out to you that just says, Report X was um, released today by IGY. Go to oversight.gov if you want to read it. Um, and what occurs through the site is, um, the IGs have agreed that when they post their reports to their own web page, they simultaneously post it to oversight.gov. Um, the this site was built initially on a platform that the Postal IG Office had um, through our volunteer efforts. So it's, there was no appropriated funds directly used to build the site, um, but and so it's in a pretty basic form. But the good news is. Um, in FY19, the FSGG um, Appropriations Subcommittee in the House site, currently chaired by Congressman Quigley, um, provided the SIGI community with $2 million to build out certain functions I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the draft um, legislation that's going to be considered by the committee has additional funds to allow us to continue to maintain and operate uh, the web page. Um, so here's what you see if you go to oversight.gov. Um, Sorry. Like little, there you go. That's okay. No, actually, I was going to stay right there for one second oh. and then go to the next page. <laughs> there you go. Um, the And the whole idea behind this, by the way, this is why this is a perfect location to be talking about this, because this is all designed to bring greater transparency to the public about the operations of their government, for policymakers, for congressional members, staff, OMB, other um, leaders in the policymaking community. What you get when you go to oversight.gov is this landing page, um, which aggregates in one place a, um, uh, a series of tables for you, including um, the potential cost savings there that we've identified through our work. Before oversight.gov, the community is required by law to put out a book that annually summarizes these numbers. It would take us months and months and months to do it. 
this is now in real time. That, those bar charts and those numbers change every time a new report is uploaded. So the public sees, as it's happening day to day, uh, what we're finding and what we're saving. And if they want to, I'll just go back here because it didn't get picked up. They can go, you can see a map of the United States. So if you want to drill down and look in a particular state, particular location within the state, you can do that to see if there are reports from that location. You also can, um, when you go to the search page, search for topics of interest um, that you may have and see, again, aggregated what reports have been issued by, IG, by IGs. So for example, if you want to see what the IG community has done in terms of opioids related work, you type in opioid, you can refine your search further, you can find cross-cutting work, work that cuts across the community um, in that space. You want to see what whistleblowers have done and what kind of results have been um, uh, uncovered by IGs as a result of whistleblower information. You type in whistleblowers. You, want, you have a, a particular uh, disaster relief effort. You want to understand where has the funding gone and how has it worked. You can go and use that search page. What's happened so far? Well, we have 71 IGs on, two IGs, um, the Capitol Police and the CIA actually don't release public reports. Um, so all 71 IGs that release public reports are on the site. We now have 11,000 plus reports and counting, so every day that number will keep changing. Um, there's one million hits per year to this site, um, which gives you a sense of how useful it has proven to be. Um, and we currently have 18,700 followers on Twitter which may or may not seem like a big number to you, depending upon your point of view. But for the IG community, that's one of the highest numbers by far that you'll find in the inspector general community. So one of the great things about this site is it not only allows people who follow, for example, the Department of Justice OIG but to see our reports, but it allows people um, to learn about all of the other work going on in the inspector general and oversight community and bring greater transparency as a result um, to um, the public and the work of government and where their money is going and how it's being used. Planned enhancements. This is what's being funded and supported by the FSGG appropriations and the support we've gotten from Senate and House um, members. We have an open recommendations database pilot. This is our key project that we have underway. We are looking to expand this to allow the public to see all of the thousands of open recommendations from the IG community that have not been implemented and that could result in substantial cost savings. That is a something that I think would be a tremendous value to the public, to policymakers, to OMB, to appropriators, you can go on and on and on, um, about where there could be greater cost savings and more efficiencies found in the government. And bringing that kind of transparency to the public I think is critical cross-agency whistleblower form. We want to use, build a web page off of oversight.gov to better inform whistleblowers and better direct whistleblowers um, when they want to report uh, waste, fraud, abuse, and misconduct. A disaster assistance page we want to complete the build out of, um, given all of the additional funding that goes through appropriations following the various natural disasters we've unfortunately had to deal with in this country over the last several years. An IG vacancies dashboard, there are a number of IG vacancies and members have asked us in particular to build a page like this so the public can know and see what positions are vacant and haven't had nominees uh, issued for them, but also the ones that have nominations and have been pending for long periods of time in the Senate. Um, and then finally, oversight.gov can host web pages for IGs, allowing us to better control um, the, our web pages, the speed with which we can update information, result in cost savings for IGs, because currently most of us have our agencies hosting our web page on their uh, portals, um, requiring additional costs from, for us, but also limiting our ability to uh, manage them. So those are some of the efforts we have underway. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from members on the Hill. Um, if you go and you see who among our 18,000 followers are, you will see members of Congress and their staffs, obviously, a lot of news reporters. Again, if you talk about transparency, we get a considerable amount of inquiries from news reporters because they want to write about these stories and it's generating, um, as we've learned, 
um, as IGs, transparency is the best disinfectant. Um, it is what causes change in government, um, and that's what this page is designed to do. So thank you for the hopefully within my five or six minutes, um, and I appreciate uh, you're all looking at the page, thinking about the page, and the Congress's continued support for the page. So thank you, Dan. So I wouldn't be uh, human if I didn't go and talk about my own stuff as well. So I'm here to talk about every CRSreport.com. So we, we had a presentation on what it is to have uh, a cross-cutting multi-agency website that provides incredibly useful information about IGs. This is a secondary source, so this is put together by uh, Demand Progress and uh, the R Street Institute uh, as part of the Congressional Data Coalition. And every CRS report is intended to be kind of what its name indicates, which is a website that has every CRS report. And I used to work at the Congressional Research Service giving bad legal advice to members of Congress, so I have a bit of a proprietary interest in the website. Uh, so I thought I'd have a little fun with, since I put together the whole thing, uh, with the Inspector General. So I decided, well, are there any reports on IDs? So uh, it automatically, dynamically generates a list of the reports that are relevant. Um, Pulling from, we have about 15,000 reports on the website right now. We have more reports than CRS has on its website because they take them down regularly. Uh, and we don't just have the long form reports, but uh, sort of other things as well. So you put in Inspector General, you have a bunch of options. You click through. Here is a history of, of Federal Inspectors General. Now, I know it's tough to see from the cheap seats in the back, but there's a couple sort of interesting things in here. One is this is displaying this not as a PDF, but as movable text. So if you're in the hearing, and you want to read the report, you're not trying to like squish and open a PDF. It actually will automatically and dynamically display on your iPad, on your phone, uh, and so on and so forth. You can, of course, download it as a PDF. For the ride home on uh, the Metro, you can download it as an EPUB. Um, but what's kind of interesting here is you can actually see how there's multiple iterations of the same report. So we have numbers that show you how it has changed. So if, if you look, and I'm going to show you in greater detail. Don't worry, you don't need to squint. Uh, so if you click on, um, sort of the indication of how much has changed, it'll give you a red line. So you can literally see what's different. So if they've made minor changes in a report, then uh, you can see that. If they've made significant changes, don't worry, you don't have to read it, but you can see the blue is what's been added and the red's been what's deleted. So when you're trying to figure out, is this worth your time to read, this is a good way of sort of making that determination. Uh, we also try to automatically detect topic areas. Uh, we also chronologically display all the reports from most recent to furthest back in time. And we tweet them all out, uh, which is something that um, uh, makes a lot of sense. You can follow every CRS report. Uh, there are some things that we're missing. We don't have all of the historical reports, but we do have an archive that a university in Texas gave us of an additional 5,000. Uh, we're trying to build it out. Our goal is to go out of business. I do not want to be the person that provides CRS reports. I want CRS to be the people that provide all the reports. Uh, there's legislation that's moving them in that direction, but it's not quite there yet. Um, so in the meantime, uh, if you're interested, everycrsreport.com is a great resource to find um, current and historic CRS reports and to see what's changed over time. And that's it. So next up, Andrew Weber with the Library of Congress. Good afternoon. So I'm Andrew Weber, the product owner for Congress.gov. I work at the Library of Congress in the office of the Chief Information Officer. I work with people from across the library to work on Congress.gov. We have subject matter experts from the Congressional Research Service, um, from the Law Library of Congress. It's a nice collaboration across the library. And we also work with um, stakeholders across Capitol Hill, the, the Clerk's Office in the House, the Secretary of the Senate in the Senate. And we started Congress.gov. Um, Back in 2012, we launched the first beta in September. And we switched to, um, about a year and a half ago, a every three week release cycle. So we're really um, quickly turning around feedback into usable data for the website. And Congress.gov replaced Thomas, which was retired about two years ago, in 2006 in July. And an example of us pulling in feedback and then using the feedback is when we added this quick search page, um, the box that circled was small and didn't have the words and phrases um, label, as well as when you'd go to it, the cursor would be defaulting to the legislation and the law numbers box. We had a lot of Hill staffers and a lot of feedback say it was confusing. I need to just start typing in my search phrase. And so we made these tweaks based on um, doing several user interviews and studies. So a lot of the changes that get made to Congress.gov are a direct result of Hill users and the public providing us feedback. 
What have we been working on lately? We've really been working to beef up and enhance the save search email alerts on congress.gov. So if you have something you want to track in Congress, you can do a, a nice search. And for that, you'll get an update. And with these updates, um, when you get a new email, it'll be triggered and it'll let you know that there's a new action, there's new committees, there's a new sponsor for everything in your search results. So if you do a nice, um, highly curated search result for everything that you're very interested in, this is a great way to um, kind of see um, if there's a new text, if it became public law, and really kind of get alerted right when you have something that might be necessary. One of the other things we've been working on this year is a new combined committee schedule. This committee schedule launched earlier this year, and we continued to refine it throughout the year with our every three week release cycle. So when you come to this, you can see a weekly view. It's a high level view of everything for the week that's scheduled. And we also have a view that's a daily view that provides a little bit more information. And when you um, are on these, there's also links off both to the House repository and the Senate hearings page, so you can get the information directly from them. But we're trying to aggregate and pull all of this data together. And we've been working with them to continue to make this more and more robust. Um, Here's an example of the actual hearing on congress.gov. You can see the, the committee name with links off to their website. You can see exactly where it is, what it is, when they're providing the data. We also have a list of all the witnesses as well as PDFs of their statements. And then there's also the video integrated right on the page. So we're pulling everything together to um, try and make this an even better experience for users. Throughout the rest of this year, we're gonna keep working on the committee calendar, we're going to add links to when the committees are talking about legislation or nominees. We're going to add links directly to those. Um, we're going to do a couple other things related to that as well, and then keep making those safe search alerts work even better. And one of the other things that we've been um, diving into is the advanced search. We're trying to make sure our search can meet the needs of everyone who's trying to do really advanced analytical searches. Um, one of the things we've added before was the ability to download your search results, and we've expanded that from 500 results to 1,000, so that was one way for people to take and play with the data a little bit, and this is an, another way to get really targeted results for um, power users. And every three weeks, we're kind of going through the lot, so if you haven't looked at the site in a little bit, um, I encourage you, there are a couple different ways that we mention and broadcast what's happening. Um, the congress.gov um, enhancements page lists all of our releases going back to when we launched the site. So you can see with each release, everything that's new. So if you come back and you're like, why is this here? This is a great page for that. And we also on the Law Library of Congress blog, um, blog about each new release and talk about what's new. Also um, provide a tip that something that is generally, we hear someone say, why can't I do this on congress.gov? The tips typically are responses to those, saying you can do it, here's how, and so we try and elevate those, as well as the top 10 most viewed items in congress.gov, just because that's something people are interested in looking at and seeing, so. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, that was awesome. Uh, next up, Marcy Harris, Popbox. Great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So I'm here to talk a bit about a new offering from Popbox called Legidash. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with Popbox. We've been around now for about nine years. It's been a, it's been a while. So uh, on Popbox, you find bills listed. Individuals can come create an account, choose to support or oppose a bill, and send their message directly to lawmakers. You can see what they're saying. Also, organizations post their positions, and that's available on those bill pages, and also goes out via API to lots of different places, including if you're a user of DEMCOM, you see organization positions show up on DEMCOM as they're entered into Popbox. But if you go to popbox.com now, you'll see a new uh, box there for lawmakers and staff uh, pointing you to Legidash there. If you're a personal staff, please click it coming soon for officer and committee staff. Uh, and it, you'll go to Legidash. So this is a new entry for congressional staffers to Popbox. We've always served individuals, uh, uh, stakeholders, and Congress, but there hasn't been a way for staffers to actually come in and have their own view of Popbox. So that's what Legidash is. So if it's your first time to visit, come and you'll, you'll need to activate. So we have a database that we're working with that has all of the congressional staffers in it. Uh, and it will go and make sure you're in the database. If you're a new staffer, it may take a little bit for it to show up. Let us know if for some reason you're not there. Uh, and then you'll get to come and edit your profile. So in your profile, you'll see the information that's already in there 
Uh, you're welcome to adjust it if you got a promotion or are covering new issues. Uh, we go in and update your profile, and then you'll land on the dashboard. And uh, you are now in the office of Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin, who I hope everybody recognizes. Uh, but you'll see on the Stafford dashboard here just some basic information, the calendar of what's going on in Congress today, uh, and also Hill events. So this is where we get the receptions, the lunches, the, you know, anything that anyone sends us. If you've got a special event, a briefing, send it our way, events at Popbox. But you can go in and check and see what's going on uh, today. There is a Congressional Transparency Tools uh, briefing today. I hope you all attend. Uh, uh, then on next, you can go to the staffer directory. One of the things that we heard in 2017 is that it was becoming very difficult for staffers to go in and find contact information for their colleagues. So on the staffer directory, basically the same kind of information you saw on the profile. You can go and, uh, and search by office, by topics covered, by chamber. Uh, we'll be making that a bit better of an advanced search down the road. But basically, you can go and pull up a list of staffers, Senate or House, uh, and get their contact information. Uh, and then over to the legislation tab, uh, you can search bills. I know that that is possible on a lot of uh, the platforms here. Uh, and choose to track it. The, the, the only uh, different thing for tracking in, on this tab is that you will also get a notification if a new position is added to a bill that you're, um, that you're tracking, so an organization position in support or in opposition. But also on this page, you have the opportunity to add or edit a position, and this is new. This is in response to hearing from a lot of offices, hey, when our constituents write to us, they're telling us to please support this bill that I'm actually co-sponsoring. Or, you know, the, the constituents don't have any way to find where a lawmaker stands on a bill before they write to the lawmaker about the bill. So we're going to start trying to provide a place for this to happen. So you can go in and add or edit a position from your boss on the bill. It will take you to the bill page on Popbox. You have the option of supporting, opposing, or no position yet, because we assume that that will be the majority of people at first who are just posting, this bill is great, but if it did the three things that I want it to do, I would vote yes. Uh, but it's an opportunity to post the position there. And then anyone who's following the lawmaker or the bill on Popbox will get an update showing them uh, that the position was added, and then it gets added to the bill page down here where you can see lawmaker positions, organization positions, and constituent positions that have been entered. This is just a little illustration of the flow. Again, click to add position, select support, oppose, or no position, post it, and it goes out to the followers. You can also follow lawmakers. Again, you'll get updates in your dashboard of different actions that the lawmakers take, such as introducing a bill, co-sponsoring a bill, making a post, adding a position. And what is a post, you might ask? Well, this is a new thing. We heard from a lot of staffers last year that they were having trouble having ways to engage with constituents in a way that was easy like social media, but they, they knew their constituents would see and be able to engage with if they were following them. So the post is, works a little bit like a social media post. You can post on behalf of your boss. Um, it, it, the default approval in each office is that the chief of staff and the LD have approval uh, permission, and they can grant it to any other staffer. And basically, any other staffer can go in and create uh, a sample post, or excuse me, a draft post, and it gets sent out as a test to the, the, the people with approval um, uh, uh, permission, and uh, then it can be sent uh, to anyone who's following the lawmaker on Popbox. So you get the are you sure you're really going to send this? Yes, please. And then it goes out via email to anyone who's following the lawmaker. The interesting thing is, however, only if you are a constituent do you get this orange button at the bottom, which says reply on Popbox. So if you're just a follower, not a constituent, you get to see the posts, you get to follow. But only if you're a constituent do you have the opportunity to come and actually comment on the post. So. That works a little bit like this. You pop over to the site. You're able to add and comment. The comments are just one after the other. It's not set up so that constituents can get in a fight with each other. The, the lawmaker or the staffer on behalf of the lawmaker is the only party that can actually reply to a comment. So that's how that works. Very soon, we'll have a version of this for committees. The difference is that the posts will be on behalf of quote unquote committee staff. So it's not an individual committee staffer and it's not on behalf of the lawmaker. It will be either Dem staff or Republican staff. 
And the parties that can comment on the posts are the stakeholders. So not individual constituents, but stakeholders that are registered on the platform. That's it. Please check it out. You need no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, let's see. I guess I do. Down arrow. Down arrow. Sorry, I know it's a little. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> well, my name is Benice Smith. I'm with the Office of the Clerk, and I'm going to take a few minutes to go through a demonstration of a clipping tool and also the new Clerk of the House website, Clerk Preview. Um, and so I'm going to take a few minutes to do that, and I'm going to talk about the floor proceedings and the, um, the clipping tool. Sorry about that. Um, so before televised uh, recordings made its debut in 1947 and C-SPAN began broadcasting live feedings, live floor proceedings in 1979, did it, did it turn over? okay, in 1979, <laughs> um, there was, people had to go to the floor, uh, to the gallery in 1789. So I feel like this went a little fast. <laughs> Yeah, I think it went a little fast, but that's okay. That's okay. Okay, sorry about that. So you may have heard of the naming of John Beckley, the first clerk of the house in 1789, if you were present on the floor that day. And so under our, our new clerk, Cheryl Johnson, the the, under our current clerk of the House, Cheryl Johnson, much of the duties have remained the same, to support legislative functions of the U.S. House of Representatives as a nonpartisan organization. Additionally, the clerk's office has been instrumental in using technology to facilitate, and, uh, facilitate administrative duties and provide legislative information to members and the public. So one decade ago, the clerk's office um, introduced HouseLive.gov, a tool for the public to view floor footage. And so fast forward 230 years from the first session of Congress in 1789, people are still interested in viewing the floor proceedings of Congress and participating where they are. So whether they're on their computer, on a laptop, or on a tablet. So my developer and programming colleagues in LCS produce what is now two ways to view floor proceedings on clerkpreview.house.gov and live.house.gov. So live.house.gov is the modernized version of houselive.house.gov. Clerk Preview is our new website. Um, it's the rede redesigned website, and it provides direct access to legislative information for the public. Through that site, people may view the live proceedings if the House is in session. So they would simply click on the arrow there to begin to, to stream live, or they would go to the live TV link. There are a number of benefits of going to the live TV stream link. Um, there are durable URLs, so if you're working with constituents and you wanted to send them to where your member is speaking, you can take that copy of that link and send it to them directly. Um, it's easier navigation, so with the calendar tool, at the, the little widget at the top, so you can also go back and forth and see what, you know, what days we were in session. You can see the information there. It's um, also easier navigation with the back and forth date feature, so you can do that as well. The day that I was looking at when I did this was uh, this week, Tuesday the 4th, and on that day there were five bills introduced, and there were a number of votes that day. So you can also go back and forth and see that information. You can click on the roll call link and it will take you to the clerk's house, the clerk of the house information for the roll call votes. Um, people can use the caption text section of the site to search for the unedited closed caption text. Um, so if your member said something specific and you wanted to find that information, you can go to the search bar and use the closed caption section. You can also sort by the speaker. So if you are looking for what a, a specific member said, you can use the toggle bars up there to search back and forth. And one of the important things um, is the time section. So if you're a staffer and you wanted to find the time information, you can go there and get the time. That's going to help you when you're providing a, a clipping. So floorclips.house.gov is what is available to staff. So that other site, clerkpreview.clerk.house.gov, is available to anyone. But floorclips.house.gov is for the staff in particular. Um, the, the feeds go back to January 
2018, so a good amount of footage right now. And um, what you can do when you're in that section is you can go find, you can go search by month and then you can find a specific day that you're looking for. So it gives, so far there's only been three, um, three days, three legislative days in this month of June. And so you can see here just that much time. We've also provided a help guide. So if you're a staffer um, and you want to get help, you can go to the help guide from that section at the top of the floor clips page, floorclips.house.gov. And our guide offers step-by-step -step directions and how to make an effective clip. So here's just an example of what that interface looks like. You can, and as I mentioned earlier with the time, you can either go to the time that you know from using the toggle bars at the bottom, the white bars at the bottom, or you can enter in a specific hour, and that would be the difference if you're a staffer making that clip. So when you create your clip, it's going to be an MP4 with 420 by 272 pixels, and you can either upload that um, clipping to your website or your social media page. And so that concludes my information. I hope that's informative for you. Um, also, just as a quick plug, housenet.house.gov is a, a, is a really important resource if you're a staff person. And it will um, give you information to like the committee repository that my colleague mentioned earlier too. So thank you. Here you go. Yeah. Thank you. Vanessa, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, the clerk's office is just phenomenal on all these things. Uh, Steve. Thanks so much. My name is Steve Schultz. Uh, I'm the oddball here. I'm going to talk to you about court records. So hopefully that'll be interesting or useful to you. If not, don't worry. It'll all be over soon. Uh, but uh, so I'm here today on behalf of, uh, of courtlistener.com, which is a, a project of the Free Law Project, which is a 501c3 that works on these issues. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you about a project called uh, RECAP which is focused on a particular type of judicial information that is public records uh, that are available through the judiciary's service called PACER. Some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, recap, uh, we, think, we like to think if we have nothing else, we have a good name, uh, a good acronym, RECAP, we're turning PACER around. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Recap is really uh, two things. One is a browser extension that you can install in your browser, Chrome or Firefox, coming soon to Microsoft Edge, and, uh, and an archive. Uh, the, what the browser extension does is every time you visit a PACER website, and each court has its own PACER website, and look at a docket or download documents that have been filed, it uploads it to a free public archive. And the free public archive is the second part of what Recap is. It's a free public archive that you can go to on the court listener site and uh, browse any of those uh, documents that have been uh, liberated uh, or search through them, set up alerts and the like. And I'll show you a little bit about that. So those are the two parts of Recap. I think that might be relevant to some of you if you are tracking current litigation. It might also be relevant to you, uh, well, I'll say this, PACER might be a cautionary tale for approaches to government transparency. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. So for those of you who don't know, PACER uh, is a system that's actually run individually by each district and circuit court. Um, it's the way that the public looks at what's happening in the, in the courts. And these are public records. Uh, the important caveat is that in order to support the system, the courts charge for access, so they charge per page that you download, or per page of docket entries that you look at, or for every search that you do. Um, and that has been, so far, the funding mechanism for the court. Uh, that's been good for getting these systems built and continuing to support them, but it makes it difficult for transparency. It's hard to share a document and say, hey, this was the complaint in this really important lawsuit, or this just, uh, this just uh, came out, this opinion just came out. Uh, so. Recap is uh, part of a response to that. Just to give you a sense for, if you haven't seen uh, uh, Pacer, this is what a docket page looks like. It's not that much to look at. Um, it's a little bit old school. This particular case happens to be a case in which the uh, Georgia legislature is claiming copyright over their annotated code 
And uh, Carl Malamud, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with in the room, uh, has challenged them on that. This is the district court version of the case. Uh, and we'll know as soon as Monday if the Supreme Court takes the case. Uh, he, won in, he won in circuit court, but he still wants them to take it, uh, to pronounce that edicts of government are public. In any event, what RECAP will do when you're visiting a docket page like this is if someone else has already liberated that document, it'll add a little blue icon. Again, it's not much to look at. It's a simple idea. Click on this instead of this, and you get it for free. Similarly, if you're looking at if you're deciding whether or not to look at the docket for a particular case, before you uh, click on the docket, if you have Recap installed, it'll show you a little thing here saying, view this docket as of however long ago for free from Recap. This one hasn't been updated in a while because it's now in, in the higher court, so there's nothing new to look at. But if you clicked on that, that would take you to a court listener page where you can see all of this public and for free, assuming that someone has already liberated it. And now that there are tens of thousands of users of Recap, there are a lot of those documents that have been liberated. So a couple of interesting features at the top of this page. Um, first, you can uh, search within the docket, which is not possible on Pacer. Uh, importantly, you can get alerts. This is kind of like the, the congress.gov functionality to be able to get alerts of searches when new things happen. And in fact, I think congress.gov is a great example of what Pacer could be, or a complement to Pacer could be. Really, what, we, what the public sees mostly now in terms of court transparency is, if at all, is the final opinions. Those are theoretically sent to the GPO. They're posted on GovInfo. Um, not reliably. We have studies about the, some of the operational problems with that. So not even those make it all the way. But if you think about most of what's going on in, in, on the legislative side, most of the interesting news is, well, there's a new bill, there's a new sponsor, this is moving forward, it moved out of markup. The, le the, the judicial equivalent of that is there was a new motion on the docket, there was a motion to dismiss, there was a new brief, uh, there was an opinion, it got appealed. Uh, all of that is very hard to, to follow or even know about if you're a layperson, especially if it's behind a paywall. So I think that congress.gov is a great example of what the judiciary could be. And that's also why I think PACER is a bit of a cautionary tale about what happens when you try to use user fees to support transparency systems. Um, and then if, if you're looking at a partic particular uh, case, a particular docket page, uh, it's not too much different from if you were looking at, uh, at it on PACER, but it's searchable. And you can look at things for free. And you can share permanent links that you can email around so other people can refer to them. And you can subscribe to find out when new things are posted. I should also mention there's a recap specific uh, section of Court Listener uh, that includes all of these materials that are updated by users. Um, Court Listener also incorporates a bunch of data from other feeds, um, including appellate court decisions and other things, and makes those all search searchable as well. And there is a search. <laughs> It's simple, uh, it does what you would expect, um, and it does what Pacer doesn't do. Pacer th theoretically has a search, it's called the Pacer Case Locator, um, and in my anecdotal experience, it's very unreliable, um, almost to the point of being proactively unhelpful, because if you want to know, is there litigation about such, a th such and such, or has somebody sued such and such, um, getting an answer from Pacer, the official record that the answer is no could be a bad thing. You really don't want to get um, false negatives. So um, in any event, there is a search. It is also not complete because we haven't liberated all of PACER. Um, and I should also say, uh, like Daniel said about CRS reports, uh, in the long run, Court Listener, this nonprofit, would like to put itself out of business and would like others to be able to uh, process this data. They have APIs that are open. You can download machine-readable versions of things. Um, and ultimately, it would be great if the government could take that part of the process over, making it easily accessible and machine-readable. I already mentioned how great it would be if court records were like, uh, like legislative records, um, and if they looked like congress.gov. 
We also have some legislative, potential legislative interventions. I'm not here to lobby about that, but I do want to note that there is a bill introduced uh, by Representative Collins, co-sponsored by Representative Quigley and others, uh, focused on this issue that would fund the courts so that they could make this all freely accessible. And I'm told that there may be some companion bill action in the not too distant future. Um, so keep your eyes out for the Electronic Court Records Reform Act of 2019 as well. Uh, and I'm not Mike, but Mike is in charge of, of the court listener. Um, his name is Mike Listener, um, uh, another um, product naming pun. But you can email Mike if you're interested, if you want to take a look at the project, if you want to install and use Recap, free.law slash recap. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. I mean, this is phenomenal. I use it all the time. So please. Um, do I press? There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Hammer, and I have been working at GovTrack for about three years. Um, I'm the external relations associate, and um, GovTrack has been around for about 15 years, so there's a lot of resources to talk about, some for constituents, some for staffers, but I'm just going to go over three of those things today, and hopefully they'll be useful to all of you. Um, the first one that I want to talk about is, oh, that's going the wrong direction. Um, in that case, the first one that I want to talk about is congressional district maps. Um, so if you are a um, correspondent or a caseworker and you get a call from a constituent and they give you their address and you want to know where do they live, is it in my district, this is a nice tool where you type that address in that search bar you see right above the fun map there um, and it will tell you. It'll tell you the district they live in and who their reps are and all of that. Um, it's better to be more specific with it. If you just type a zip code, then it'll tell you all of the districts that are associated with that zip code. Um, so this is the home page of the site. And the other tool that I wanted to talk to you about was um, text analysis. And this is a tool that lets you compare a bill to previous versions of itself or to other related bills. We find related bills on various factors. Sometimes they share text. Um, so if you were using the site, then you'd see that search bar right up at the top. You could type in the bill number, and it'd take you straight to the bill page. I went ahead and clicked on text and started comparing this bill, the Bipartisan Background Checks Act, um, to from when it was placed on the calendar in the Senate to when it was first introduced in Congress. And you'll see there's these red boxes. You might recognize those as from every CRS report. They're sort of a similar thing where the red is different. Um, and of course, the tops of the bills look different. But if you go down, the reason this is a nice example is that you can see there are specific parts of the text that have changed. On the left is the bill as it is now. And on the right is the bill as it was introduced. So depending on what that text says, it could significantly change the meaning of the bill. And if you imagine this were an appropriations bill, you could be seeing a change in a dollar amount. And that would be significant and worth tracking. Um, so there's that. Uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about is say you are your boss is Mike Thompson, who is the sponsor of HR8. And you want to whip up some co-sponsors for that bill, um, although he already has. Um, then what you might want to use is the bills, the uh, view co-sponsors tool on GovTrack. And so you'll go down to bill sponsored on his page. And if you click, if you see at the bottom of the bill sponsored section, there's this view co-sponsors button. If you click that, you're going to find a list of Mike Thompson's co-sponsors. So these are for bills that um, Mike Thompson has sponsored, who has co-sponsored the most of them. And they are in order of frequency. And each one, it looks like this paragraph format. Uh, for those of you in the back, that's a list of uh, legislative topics, and it has each number for each one. So for example, if you are talking about the firearms bill, then um, which we were just looking at, then maybe you say that goes in crime and law enforcement. So what you want to do is scroll down. You could control F to find all the different uh, mentions of crime and law enforcement. And so we see that Anna Shu is the most common co-sponsor, and we can look over that she's co-sponsored 15 crime and law enforcement bills. Um, but if we scroll down, it turns out that actually it takes scrolling down pretty far before you find the next most frequent crime and law enforcement person. Um, 
and that would be Grace Napolitano, it turns out. So these are people that you could potentially say, okay, we have interests in common, and I know because of this list, so I'll go talk to them and their staff about um, co-sponsoring my bill, or my boss's bill. Um, and if you click on those numbers, you'll notice they're all hyperlinks. It's going to take you to our advanced search tool, which has the list of all the bills. Maybe they turn out to all be unrelated, or they are very related. And on the left there is a search criteria that lets you filter out, diff change the filters. So if you want to look at a different member, or if you want to change the topic, you can do that too. Um, I've passed out a list. Th this is only a few of the features that are available on GovTrack, and the handout that I've passed out has a um, more extensive list on it, although, once again, we've been around for a long time, so even I don't know everything that's available. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. Oh, the town. All right. Or not. Actually, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Open up. It. I broke it. It's okay. Nobody can see that, though. Okay. So, my name is Derek Willis. I work at a, a journalism nonprofit called ProPublica. You may have heard of us. We, um, or may not have. Generally speaking, we, people don't like to hear from us when we call them, so it's <laughs> nice to have, like, somewhat ambivalent, if not friendly, audience <laughs> to talk to. Um, uh, and I'd like to talk to you today about our, uh, our website, our web app, uh, called Represent. Uh, as a way of introduction, I've been, uh, I used to work at Congressional Quarterly. I left that organization a long time ago, and the first thing I did the day after I left was like, was in instantly regretted losing access to all the data that I had at Congressional Quarterly. Since then, I've been building increasingly sophisticated websites to replicate the information that I used to have access to. Um, so ProPublica, uh, like I said, we're a nonprofit journalism organization. Uh, Represent is our news app. We call them news apps, which essentially compiles data from various uh, sources. We are a lot like, for example, we have a lot in common with GovTrack and other organizations and efforts that do similar things. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about some of the differences, um, and, uh, and then I want to co cover a couple of things. One is that we have an API that's free to use that provides some of this data in case you want to make something like Represent, but better looking or more useful or just you know, like specific to you. And then lastly, I have my plea to congressional staff. Uh, so Represent is built on sort of the uh, main building blocks that like GoTrack and other sites are, which, you know, members, bills, votes. We do a couple other things, though, uh, that I think um, make us, uh, you know, useful to folks. We pull in uh, all of the press releases uh, from members of Congress. Um, some of the committees were working on finishing that. Um, and we do some stuff with that that I'll briefly uh, describe. Uh, we also kind of provide a, uh, an integrated lobbying search. That's, again, and this is not a high bar necessarily, but so I think it's a little bit more user-friendly than some of the, like, the free lobbying search uh, portals out there. Um, uh, and finally, uh, we are uh, a little early uh, down the road this, in the road in this, we, we post sort of uh, the uh, House office expenditure data, which obviously it's CSV files now, but we've been, we took over a project that Sunlight had done previously, and so we post um, that data as CSV files going back to 2000, third quarter 2009. Um, and we're going to do some more stuff with that data as we go forward. Some of the differences. We provide like member activity feeds. Uh, so unlike sort of like our, our friends at GovTrack who are sort of like helping, maybe helping you do some, you know, do some things, uh, we're sort of trying to track what it is that you've done. Uh, what are the, or the member has done, or uh, when people write about the member. So with uh, we pull in stuff from Google, thanks to Google News, like when news organizations write about a member, uh, we track sort of and provide a little bit of a feed, uh, a news feed kind of a view of uh, sort of activities. And like this gives a very, very small aspect of the stuff that we track. Uh, but one of the, my favorite things that we track is we track the uh, personal explanations that some of you may have had to fill out the form and submit it to the clerk's office. Uh, like, we're one of the only places that does that because I'm obsessed with them. Um, and, uh, but they're useful and we, you know, let people know that we have them. Um, we uh, also um, uh, track a, a few other, like, we tell you a little bit of value add in the sense that we tell you, like, when somebody votes against a, uh, a majority of their party. You know, we sort of highlight that and be like, hey, this person does that. Um, and, um, and a few other things that you should check out your member or another member you can see. With press releases, we take the full text of those 
And uh, we do a little bit of natural language processing on those to kind of derive some meaning. One of the things that we do is we try to figure out um, what distinctive topics that a member talks about that other members don't talk about. And this is only via the press releases, although we're going to actually integrate congressional rec floor speeches from the record to do this as well. They're a little bit different. Uh, they're, they're a lot different in many ways. But, um, but the press release stuff has been pretty useful. Um, we also use uh, some natural language processing techniques to figure out who kind of sounds like, you know, which lawmakers kind of use the same kind of syntax or phrases. And some of that is uh, sustained in the sense that, like, it through, you know, over time, they still kind of use the same language. And some of that is episodic in the sense that you can see when members decide to work together on bills, they start to use the same languages in press, in press release. And you can kind of see that on represent when that occurs. Um, uh, we have a, like I said, we have a, uh, an API, which is basically just the data without um, with, without all the, you know, decoration. Uh, it is free. It has uh, votes, uh, bills, a lot of the stuff that uh, other folks have. Uh, but it also has, like, the press releases as well, if you want to get those, um, and a few other, a few other uh, bells and whistles in there. And then uh, uh, we, like I said, we, we grab all the press releases. But if you use Drupal as your CMS, uh, can someone please just turn on like the RSS feed by default because it's turned off by default, which is a bad choice, really. Um, uh, and and so like whoever you need to talk to that, please. So that would be a great. And then frankly, if you need like an intervention and I can be there to help do that, I would love to do that with somebody. So also we uh, we do extract uh, when we look at the press releases. One of the things we do is we look for bill numbers mentioned in press release so we can connect a press release to a bill. And so you look at a bill page on Represent, and you'll get a list of press releases that mention that bill, but we use the bill number. And so, hey, throw the bill number into the press release, and we will, we will love you for that. And I'm sure others will as well, right? Uh, and lastly, you can, uh, if you look at Represent and be like, that's not right, or that seems weird, or, oh, I like this, you know, we'd love to hear from you about, I'd love to hear from you about that, uh, and would love to fix things uh, uh, and make it better. So thank you. Next up is Sheila. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Down uh, sorry? Down there. Down there. Got it. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Sheila Krumholtz. I'm with the Center for Responsive Politics, and we run the website Open Secrets. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit research group that tracks money in politics. And uh, so I'm going to review a few quick things and then dive into lobbying. So uh, what you're seeing here, if you can see it, is um, total contributions, total spending, rather, in the last election cycle. You'll see the big jump in 2018. Uh, so we track uh, total spending by cycle over time. These are the midterms compared. So that's the kind of long-term trends that we're trying to show through our data. We also drill down to show and offer granular level uh, access to data on campaign contributions, spending, personal finances. Um, uh, and then, again, lots and lots of uh, stats on long-term trends. Uh, so again, for the last cycle, it was $5.7 billion, way up from $3.5 billion in 2014, the last midterm. And so what, well, the significance, or one, one item of significance is that it costs more to win. You see the spike in, or the jump in 2018 compared to previous cycles. So in the Senate, an average uh, winning Senate campaign now costs $15.7 million on average. Some cost far more than that. And in the House, winners averaged about uh, $2 million. And 2018 saw nine of the 10 priciest House elections, uh, House races ever, not counting special elections. Still, for all that change, the House reelection rate hovers in the 90 range um, and uh, just shy of that in the Senate. Uh, so not a lot of change. We also look at where the money comes from, and there was a lot of hue and cry about small uh, individual donations. They did rise from about 640 million to over a billion last cycle, but the big money is still coming from the big donations from individuals giving more than $200. That's nearly 50% at about nearly $3 billion. So turning to uh, lobbying, the other side of the influence buying coin, on Open Secrets, uh, you'll find more than two decades of data from the Clerk of the House and Senate, Secretary of the Senate, thank you, um, which we then take in code by industry, standardized by organization, 
Uh, we identify parent organization, uh, the lobbying firm standardized, and the lobbyist, which we would love to not have to standardize if they would provide a unique ID, which exists, but is not public facing. So anyway, um, there are efficiencies that could be baked into the data, the public record, that we would love to see. Uh, and it adds up. Uh, in the last cycle, as I said, $5.7 billion for campaign contributions, or spending, rather. Lobbying, $6.8 billion uh, for during that same time period. So spending uh, and registrations, both are going up now since 2017. And you can see that tracked over time here as well. Uh, on this section of our site in lobbying, you can see all kinds of things. The growth over time by quarter, by uh, year, uh, as well as the growth for a particular industry or sector, growth or decrease. Top spending clients, top earning lobbying firms, top lobbyists, total spending by sector and industry, uh, recent registrations, which we get from the House, uh, which firms get uh, got the most uh, expensive lobbying, uh, rather, which firms, I guess it doesn't go down, uh, got the most expensive lobbying contracts. Um, so a lobbyist walks in your door. Who is he or she? In this case, we're picking on Sage Eastman. Uh, <laughs> just one example. Uh, here's the research you'll find on him on Open Secrets. A summary page listing his employer, his clients by year, back to 1998. Uh, tabs at the top, if you can see them, show uh, contributions, <laughs> official position, issues, and bills. Uh, and then a deeper dive in that gold circle is um, past employment in our revolving door database. Uh, and what a client list he has, 70 clients listed for just, uh, just the first quarter of this year. Is he really representing 70 clients? I don't know, he's a busy guy. Uh, we also show whether and how much the lobbyists gave in contributions, as I said, and to whom by party, broken up by party, and also their total contributions when combined with their family members. Some lobbyists are married to lobbyists, and so together they give, they really pack a punch. Um, and as you can see here, last year Mr. Eastman doled out $28,000, uh, all to Republicans in his case, a little more when including other family members. And of course, plenty of lobbyists give only to Democrats, some hedge their bets and give to both sides. On the official position tab, we show but do not standardize Eastman's past work as strategy advisor to Ways and Means, deputy staff director for the majority, and communications director to Representative Dave Camp. We list every unique version of whatever they put, which, as you can see, is mostly redundant and very messy. Uh, one day we hope this will be filed electronically in a smart form that allows lobbyists to list it once so that there aren't two dozen different way answers to the same question. Uh, and so the lobbyists stop listing themselves as merely president, which is not very helpful. Uh, the lobbying forum provides about 80 broad issue categories to choose from when reporting lobbying activity. Eastman said he lobbied on taxes, which is routinely uh, the most common of all issue areas, and he listed it in 132 different reports last year. And Eastman reported lobbying on 90 different specific bills last year. Uh, with HR1, the Tax Cuts and Job Act, listed in 116 different reports. Uh, all of that really leads me to question whether he's just listing every client for the firm. I think it is about every client for the firm and whether he's really uh, active on their behalf. Um, so one question is, what are the rules governing interpretation of the forms? You have to really um, dig in to find out what, uh, what is standard and whether they are providing information that is relevant or merely kind of flooding us with information. Finally, after you've walked through his current and past reported lobbying activity, take a spin through the revolving door database uh, to find out more about his pre-K Street days, including that he not only worked for Ways and Means at Dave Camp, but also the Office of the Michigan Attorney General, uh, Dick Posthumus for Governor Campaign, and the Michigan Republican Party. And finally, in addition to LDA data, we also track foreign lobbying or FARA data in our Foreign Lobby Watch section, and that will further be aligned uh, with the LDA data later this year. Thank you. So last but certainly not least, my friend Steve Dwyer. And this is a whole different thing, so let me see if I can actually get this working for you. 
Live demos are always dangerous. Here it's number 10, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quigley, uh, for doing this, and Hannah and Daniel. Um, so my name is Steve Dwyer, and I uh, work from Geordie Leader Steny Hoyer. And I've worked with him for a long time. And he's been very wise over the years uh, to uh, invest both his staff and some budget in uh, making cool technology to make Congress work better. Uh, and he does that for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because he's an institutionalist that really cares about uh, Congress. Uh, and also uh, because it makes him look good in front of his constituents in leadership, which is his members. Uh, so. Uh, Dome Watch is probably the best exemplification of that. Uh, it is built specifically for our members to make their day-to-day -day jobs better, um, and it is heavily used by members. And of course, then as a result, it's useful to staff. And um, also, a major plus of making cool technology stuff for Congress is uh, it presents inevitably great opportunities for transparency. And uh, we have certainly made every opportunity to take advantage of those over the years. Um, so Dome Watch uh, was originally cre called Whip Watch. It was created uh, f uh, four years ago, 1.0, and the original innovation was just that we, in, as the number two position in democratic leadership, uh, manage the floor, and so therefore we send out the coveted d uh, floor update emails. And uh, those were just like, uh, we're going to vote in an hour, and then we're going to vote in five minutes, and then we're voting now. And <laughs> Uh, it also has party info. It's like, you know, Dems are urged to vote yes or no when we have an opinion. We don't always have an opinion. Um, and uh, before Dome Watch, that information was private, was secretive. Only uh, Democratic staff and members got it. And Dome Watch was a wonderful opportunity to not only make cool new tech, but to open it up to the world. And uh, so uh, it now is uh, floor updates are available on our website. For the first year or two, they were only available through the app. We kept it exclusive to help promote the app for a little while. But that was the core innovation. It was simple. It's like what they already were getting in their email. But the thing was, members actually wanted notifications for vote alerts when they don't want notifications for their email, because their email is a mess like everyone else. Uh, so that was the, the original simple thing. Um, but since it's so successful and we're now in members' pockets and it got their eyeballs, um, we've developed many other things. And so just a couple months ago, we released 3.0. Uh, we changed the name from Do Whip Watch to Dome Watch because we're no longer the Whip. We're now the majority leader. Um, and when we did so, we released a cheesy two-minute video that I'm now going to share for with you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Sorry, my technology is really old. I did update last night. Here it goes. In this little all right, and there's no audio. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can fix it. If not, it's not a big deal. No. I'm happy to announce a big. It was. It was. Is there audio? Just there is. It is. This is sorry, guys. Did it stop? Volume all the way up. I'm sorry. This. This is why live demos are always fun. I'm sorry, Steve. No problem. He makes this funny joke about I got a new watch. No, it's not this watch. It's the new dome watch. Yeah, well, we can't even. I was going to do that. Just, but, uh, yeah, here. Sorry about that. Here, I'll bring you to the other part that you want, though. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I, I still, even without sound, want to show the video because it shows the live voting stuff, which is sort of the coolest stuff. Um, no problem. Uh, and so he, he goes through his, his jokes, and then we have a demo time. The house floor even easier. I, I, people on Twitter said they're now very dad like jokes, which I uh, took as a compliment Don't since worry. I help write them, and I'm a father. All the features you love most from the previous versions. Um, so uh, when we get into demo time here, uh, you can see uh, those are just all the floor updates, which is what almost everyone wants uh, notifications for. You can see, you know, four or five votes, last votes. Also, like on Friday, late on Friday, we always do the, you know, like uh, what, what the schedule looks like right now for next week. Um, and we do that very much more timely than we even do with the daily and weekly schedules, which also are available on Dome Watch. Those have always been publicly available. Um, and then uh, another sweetener we added way back in 1.0 was jobs listings. Uh, this is just another opportunity that our, our, our staffers really, really wanted. And I actually know that the existing ones, when they started charging money, just kind of bugged me. Because uh, I know that uh, ex 
prior to Dome Watch, if you wanted to know about an opening, at least amongst the House Democratic Caucus, uh, you just had to have a friend uh, that was on the chief of staff list. Offices would only email job announcements to fellow chiefs of staff for whatever stupid reason. Um, the House has a job board that nobody uses. Uh, well, some do, but most offices don't use it. And, uh, and then essentially there were just moles in the chief of staff list that were forwarding it to these paid sites that were making money off it, which just drove me nuts. Uh, and so we realized it was actually a really perfect little opportunity to add a sweetener to Dome Watch, make even more staffers love it. Um, so the jobs is also loved. And of course there's notifications, so you can get notifications whenever a new job is added. Um, so that was a big part of uh, 1.0. And I would say that all the paid services now don't need moles and they all just use our free service and we beat them by a few hours almost always, so it's nice. Um, Tom and Brad are my friends, it's all right. Um, th these are all the different notification types that you can get, uh, calendar updates. So it's also got a very good, uh, a lot of people use it for the calendar, uh, which of course you could find on the web too, but it's a nice, clean, mobile friendly version. Um, and it shows you throughout the year when voting days are added or dropped. Uh, very useful, didn't exist before in the previous majority, it was just a PDF that was never updated. Uh, um, and then, so this is what the calendar looks like. It, that's just, you know, vote days or no vote days. Okay, and here's the exciting live vote stuff. So uh, if you open Dome Watch right now, it's not very exciting because there aren't votes going on. But there's three icons across the top, and this is a new in 3.0. Uh, the first one is, are we in session today? The second one is, is the floor active? And that's important because uh, one of the top new features in 3.0 is the video, live video icon. So you can click on that and watch live video of the floor at any moment. Um, and then the third icon is we're voting right now. Not only is the floor active, but we're voting right now. And so then you have this whole drop down, which is at the top right there, which uh, if you can't see in the back, is uh, the current yays and nays and time remaining in the current vote. And the yays and nays are also broken down by party. So um, if you look in the tunnel in, in Can Longworth, uh, when the members are running to vote, they often have this up and they want to know what the hell are we voting on and what are most of my party doing. Uh, and so that's what we want to give them. Uh, this is data that uh, we get in interesting ways. Uh, so this was actually 2.0, the live voting stuff. And uh, those of you that were actively using it, uh, about six months after 2.0, we started having a lot of technical problems, but we've totally rebuilt it in 3.0 and it's working really, really well. Um, we wish we could get this straight from the clerk. I know some people in the clerk's office are in the room. Uh, instead, we screen scrape it from C-SPAN, which is lots of fun. Uh, not C-SPAN, uh, from uh, the floor house channel 31 uh, internally. Um, and that's actually where we get the video, too. We would love to use live.house.gov, uh, clerk, but that's about a minute delay. So instead, we just have the same little computer in Longworth that screen scraping is uh, live uh, webcasting the floor from channel 31, uh, which has only a two second delay using the new YouTube ultra low uh, buffer. Um, again, we'd love to stop doing those things uh, if the, and then everyone else could do it. Uh, and then what else do I want to show off? Uh, so this is the live votes and then we're about to get and, and just show, oh, the other big thing on 3.0 was in addition to video never having been available before, See here, you can see you can just click right into the live video and you can drop it widescreen and you get only two second delay of what's happening on the floor. Um, but you also get, uh, for the first time ever, uh, yeah, the notifications look great on Apple Watches too and, and Samsung Watches. Oh, the other great thing about 3.0 is that it's finally available on Android. So uh, we originally picked iOS only, only because uh, economy, we don't have a huge budget for this. Uh, but, uh, and at the time, we were about 95% of our members uh, were iOS, but that's slowly grown in the Android. And there's about five or six really passionate uh, Democratic members that are Android users that have been bugging us for years. So um, 3.0, we totally rebuilt to make it more stable and everything. Um, we used a new open platform, which is uh, for the techies in the room called a progressive web app. Uh, we heard about that and we thought, oh, that's our favorite kind. Uh, and <laughs> and we uh, it's one code base for Android and iOS, and it's also available on the web. So that was the one other thing I was going to show, um, which is domewatch.us, uh, which has never been available before. If you make it real small, it looks just like the app, or um, bigger, it's actually what it looks like also on Androids and stuff. Um, so this is the live app right now, um, and yeah, that's all. I would say just topical. We had a 
uh, unsolicited article yesterday in the Daily Dot, uh, which was uh, talking and, and it even had a number of Republican members saying that they use it on a regular basis. Uh, and this article was totally unsolicited, not that articles are ever solicited. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, 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 you know, I just, the headline is pretty cool. Um, uh, why everyone on Capitol Hill is using the House Majority Leader's app. And it, it, it talks about how staff and the press corps and everyone really are relying on it, which is great. Um, I, I anecdotally also, it, when you stand in the back of the floor, uh, there used to be huge crowds around the floor computers because uh, everyone wanted to see the, the D's and R's are voting different ways and, and who. And now it, it, there's a little bit less of a crush because you can see lots of people uh, just checking the app on the floor uh, as they're voting. So um, we're going to, we see it as a great success and we're going to keep uh, improving it. Uh, at just a couple weeks ago, uh, we ro rolled out a minor update, which we didn't do a press release and everything for. Uh, the two new minor updates are um, right at the very top. We just have from the clerk, thank you very much, the, just the latest uh, stamp on, um, on the action from the floor. So that's updated uh, you know, whenever there's an action on the floor. And then at the bottom, we added recent votes. Uh, again, pulled straight from the clerk. So it's just a couple minutes after the vote is over, after the clerk posts who voted what way. So our members asked for this, and they absolutely love it. This was already where they're going. And now, um, you know, LDs and stuff love this too, because they're like, oh, how did my boss just vote on that? Well, once the clerk posts it a couple minutes, it's also right here, and they can click at the most recent votes and see um, from a single click. Um, oh, the web version uh, maybe doesn't click, uh, but the app version goes right to the roll call. So. Uh, and that's all I got. Thanks. So, so I hope you all will uh, join me in thanking our 10 panelists for doing a phenomenal job.